Church, look at me. The government will not elect the gospel. Schools no longer respect the gospel. The courts no longer protect the gospel. The world at large rejects the gospel. But by God's grace alone, salvation goes to anyone who sincerely, genuinely, authentically selects the gospel. And those who select the gospel, oh, there will be a conviction in that person's life to stand firm, steadfast on the truth. You ain't moving me from this conviction. And here's the reality. When we truly live for the Lord, we consequentially give up the world. And good evening, Coastal Christian and church at large. It's an honor to be back in this station in the Word of God, administering it to you, retalking God's talk. And I want to actually take our current situation and our attention and use that to prime our spiritual heart to consider how hypervigilant, how serious we should be guarding our heart, our mind, our ears, and our eyes and not allowing anything that is not in a line with God's word to enter into our souls. Consider how when the president goes live or your governor in your state goes live for an update and we all watch to consider what is the latest intel, what's the latest data, what's the latest statistic, what is happening? And we have followed to date certain precautions, very serious precautions. I was in Wawa earlier, and of course, there were stickers on the ground that made sure I was reminded that I should stay six feet away from the person in front of me. We call it social distancing. And there was also a sign on the door that said you have to have a mask to even enter their premise. So interestingly enough, we follow these precautions, we follow the mandates and the guidelines, and then I consider how much that pales, look at me, in comparison to what the Bible tells us to guard. Are we putting that same time and attention into our spiritual health? Are we keeping spiritual distancing in place from false teachers, false messages, false doctrine? And the Bible is explicit about guarding ourselves from it. Now consider I'm home more than ever, like you. You might get to some odd jobs that you've been putting off in a normal work week. Something that I looked at this week dawned on me. It was a glass window in my home. And it looked clear. It looked clean. But as soon as I pulled the curtains and the sunlight shined on it, it revealed, though it looked clean and I was looking through it, when the light shined on it, I saw smudges, I saw smears, and I saw streaks that I would not have seen with my naked eye without the natural light reflecting off of it. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Some of us have given access to false teachers, false theology, and we're looking through that window and we're giving them access into our spiritual lives and it looks clear, but the moment you line it up with the word of God, biblical light, it will reveal smudges, smears, and streaks. It is crucial for us as Christians to make sure we go back to God's word to discover for ourselves what it is he has to say. And I'm challenging you to take what I share tonight, what I teach tonight, and make sure it's in alignment with God's word. My sole responsibility as a herald of the gospel is to retalk God's talk. And the reason why we need to be hyper vigilant and practice spiritual distancing from anything that is not in alignment with God's holy scriptures is because a counterfeit's intention is to fool, to deceive, and of course, to manipulate. Counterfeit purses, counterfeit clothing, their intention is to deceive and mislead. They have the name on it, but they are far from the real product. Can you recognize the authentic name of God when it's backed by the nature of God so that you can hear what it is God's heart is saying to the believer for such a time as this and just because a minister behind a pulpit quotes a Bible verse doesn't mean he's wielded it accurately. In fact, the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. Rule number one, 
always use the Bible itself as the best commentary to explain the Bible. There will be people out there that say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. And I've found it so crucial to understand the Bible doesn't contradict itself. The Bible contradicts me, my human nature, my sinful nature. The Bible is truth. It cannot be defuted. So I spend my time devoted to the scripture so that the word of life can give me the life of the word. And this is why I want you to be on guard for such a time as this. Because many of us are scrolling through social media and now more than ever we're giving access to all these other voices. Now I want to make sure you hear me carefully. I am not talking about personality behind a pulpit. There are various personalities behind a pulpit. As I said last week in the teaching, I'm not talking about even attire. Somebody has to be in a suit and a tie to preach. I'm not talking about what we're wearing, and I'm not even talking about some of what's called vibrancy in the pulpit, pulpit vibrancy. There's a lot of energy in certain pulpits. I fit that mold. I have a lot of passion, a lot of intensity, but I want you to hear me. Pulpit vibrancy does not necessarily equal Bible accuracy. So if the minister of God's word is actually in the pulpit and there's energy there and there's vibrancy there and you're looking and going, well, it looks like there's life. He's happy, enthusiastic about the word of God. I'm saying, be careful. It has to go through the word. The litmus test is whether or not he's sharing a message that comes from the word. And on the other side is also deep theology. But deep theology in the pulpit doesn't always equal vitality in the people. Just because somebody is crossing their T's and dotting their I's hermeneutically, just because their exegesis is an exposition and interpretation and explanation, it's sophisticated, just because it looks that way doesn't mean they're actually rightly dividing the word of truth and presenting to you the heart of Jesus. We now more than ever need the heart of Jesus. And the only way for us to know the heart of Jesus is if we're crucified with Jesus. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives inside of me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in my carnal man, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we understood that it was by grace that he stood. It was by grace that he lived. It was by grace that he ministered. It was by grace that he shared the gospel. And grace is a free gift that God gives us. So a crucified preacher has access to divine power to preach the crucified Savior. That's what Paul said. His intention was, I've come to not talk about anything except one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And too many men behind a pulpit are carnal ministers using carnal methods, conveying carnal messages, and producing carnal men and women. Begins here with the man of God crucifying flesh so that the Holy Spirit can administer his word through him as nothing more than a microphone or a vessel. So here's the question. How do we tell the difference behind a compromised and contrived pulpit or one that stands on biblical truth. Tonight we're going to talk about two signs of a compromised pulpit. Two signs that I'm asking you to listen, that the Holy Spirit would give you an ear to hear the difference between truth, biblical truth, and error, counterfeits. We begin in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. This is again Paul writing to Timothy, a young minister. This is the final letter written by the apostle Paul. He can literally taste death. He's that close. And he's reminding Timothy of the calling on his life as a preacher. As we discussed last Thursday, preach the word. And you can't preach the word if you're not in the word. Preach the word. Convince, he said, which is the word convict. Be convincing. Believe what you're saying. Live what you're saying. Rebuke, he said, which isn't necessarily a harsh term. We receive it that way. But rebuke means I care so much about your life and the path you're on that I'm willing to tell you the truth to get you back on what Jesus said was the narrow way. He said, correct. When we're out of order, bring us back to order. 
This was the calling on young Timothy's life. The chapter prior to, Paul says something similar. He says, Timothy, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Interesting. He said, remind them of these things. Who are the them and what are these things? Reminding them takes us back several verses to the beginning of the chapter where Paul said, hey, I'm committing to you the truth, and I want you to commit that same truth to faithful men who are to commit that truth to other people. And there's this ripple effect, this chain reaction of the ministers of God's word sharing it accurately, rightly dividing the word of truth and sharing it with those in their network, their congregation. The them are other teachers. The them is also other hearers. He's saying, don't get away from the word. Teach the word. But what are these things that he's talking about? He's talking about verses 11 to 13. In that same chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, it was a hymn which was central in Christianity in the early church. They sang this hymn, and it said this, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we also shall reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he is faithful. He cannot deny himself. This is what Paul is saying. Remind them of this central message of the gospel, which is fellowship with Christ in the midst of suffering will be succeeded by suffering, or excuse me, with glory with Christ forevermore. He's saying remind them that everything they have is from Christ and everything they have is for Christ, from Christ and for Christ. If we ran everything in our lives through those two filters, everything I have is from God, he's allowed it, he's ordained it, and everything that he's allowed is for God, for his glory, I wonder if the Christian's life would begin to reflect God's life because I recognize there's not a single thing that he's allowed to touch my day that he has not ordained for his ultimate glory. Christ is enough. That is the message of the Bible. Christ Jesus is enough. Peter would remind the church something very similar that Paul is telling Timothy. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, but there were also false prophets among the people. So this is a very common message. There's false teachers, false prophets. And Peter says, and now there are false teachers among you who will secretly bring destructive heresies. Again, a minister does not stand behind his pulpit and say, oh, today the message I'm giving to you is not in the Bible. I'm going to tell you something that's misleading. That's not how he works. It tells us that they are destructive heresies, which is the word damnable teachings. And it says they deny the Lord who bought them. Again, the minister does not come up to the plate and say, I'm about to give you a message that denies the Lord who bought us. No, no. But by denying the Lord who bought them, they are either adding to the work of Christ or detracting from the work of Christ. And this is sign number one of a compromised pulpit. It's when Jesus remains on the margin of any minister's message. Sign number one, when Jesus serves only as a point of reference as opposed to a person, the person who deserves all reverence. Huge difference in those two. One, he's just an example that the minister uses or pulls from. He uses Jesus' life as just an example, just a point of reference, while at the same time teaching methods and other tips on how to succeed in life with self-help how-to tactics. See, they teach that Jesus is just a means to an end. He's a means to behavior modification. Jesus and willpower. Jesus and this good work. Jesus and this next behavior modification advisement. Jesus and, Jesus is not just the means to an end. Jesus is the end of all means. I don't use him for blessings. I don't use him to make my life better outside of him. Jesus is all I need. The minister should only be preaching Jesus. Now you might say, wait a second, so you're telling me every message that a minister gives needs to be about Jesus, just Jesus. And I'm going, I didn't say that. 
Jesus said that on the road to Emmaus. This is after his resurrection. Two disciples are walking away from Jerusalem and they're discouraged. And Jesus shows up and enters into their conversation. They're basically saying to Jesus, did you hear about what happened? There was this man who was acclaimed by God. He did miracles and wonders. And we thought he was the redeemer of Israel. We had hoped he was the one. They killed him. Yet the women showed up to his tomb and they said it was empty. And they went and reported to our our other followers and they said that when they went to the tomb, he wasn't there. And like there's this discouragement in them. And Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27 tells us, then Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Ready? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus began expounding to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning with the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, all of the prophets and including the Psalms, Jesus began to expound upon the scriptures that they had access to. And guess what he expounded upon? He said, all of that points to me. This is Jesus saying, all that you've read about points to me. There's not a single illustration, example in the Old Testament that does not end with a fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Christ. All of it's a foreshadow pointing to the Son of God. Again, in John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says to the religious leaders, he says, you guys have your nose so close to the scriptures. You're an inch away from the scriptures, yet you are a mile away from the Savior. In John 5, 39, he said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. These are the words of our Lord. He is saying everything in the scriptures points to me. So I'm saying any minister behind a pulpit should make a beeline to point to Jesus. A beeline is actually what an actual bee does when he finds nectar and he makes a straight beeline. They call it a beeline straight way back to his hive. He doesn't deter. He makes a straight shot right to the hive. And I'm saying the minister's goal and role should be to explain the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. And we use the scriptures as our evidence to build our case for Christ. Colossians chapter 1. Again, Paul wrote this letter to Colossae, verses 15 to 18, which solidifies why Jesus Christ is preeminent and he should be in every pulpit. If he's missing from the pulpit, if he's just used as a point of reference so that the minister can act like he's preaching the Bible, but then he puts on his people self-help methods and self-willed tactics, we're missing the heart of God. Colossians 1, 15 to 18, he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the physical representation of the invisible God. Jesus is the Greek word icon of the invisible God. He is the manifestation of the invisible God. He is, as John the Apostle wrote in the first chapter of his gospel, he is the word who became flesh. He is the firstborn over all creation. Many teachers sadly err when they say that Jesus is a created being because of this one phrase in this one passage. But if they keep reading, you discover that's not what firstborn means here. Firstborn means rank. He is ranked above creation. He has ultimate status above creation. Because the next verse says, by him, all things were created. By Christ, the architect, the actual agent of creation, who's also the goal of all creation, who is the culmination of all glory, it's Christ who is the creator of, ready? Everything in heaven. Now, I can accept that. That's easy. Of course, he created the things in heaven. But when you keep reading, it says, and on earth. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth. Oh, what type of things, minister? Visible, things you see with your eyes. Invisible, things you can't see like the coronavirus. 
whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. See, the apostle, he goes into the spiritual realm. He says, he is the creator of all things. All things, ready, translation? All things means all things. Fill in the blank. All things. Creator of all things. What you see visible and what you can't see. And he enters into the spiritual realm and goes, oh, even the thrones, dominions, principalities or powers that we're told we wrestle with. Jesus is supreme and controls all that. He created all that. Doesn't stop. It goes even deeper. All things were created through him. Everything that was created came through him. All things that were created were for him, for his glory. He is before all things. This is, he is the great I am. He is eternal. So he's before everything he created, which means nothing that he created catches him off guard. He is before it, but it also means no matter what has entered your day, he's before that too. It had to pass through him before it got to you. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. In him all things are held together from the smallest molecule to the biggest planet to the entire universe, he holds it all together. He holds the world together. He holds your world, my world together. He holds our spiritual man or woman together in his hands. He holds our emotional man or woman together. And yes, he even holds our physical man or woman together. And nothing can ever touch your life that has not passed through the great love and the scarred hands of Jesus Christ. Christ. He holds it all together. He is also the head of the church, the body. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have, here's the word, preeminence. He is supreme. He is superior. He is sovereign. This word sovereign means he controls everything and not just controls everything, He's in charge of everything. Remember, the message of Christianity is Christ. The message of Christianity is not self-esteem. The message of Christianity is esteem Jesus Christ. So he is either, according to this passage and other ones that we're going to cover, he is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. I either give him crown, king, authority over all, or I say he's not Lord over anything. That's why sign number two of a compromised pulpit is so crucial to recognize. This false theology is prevalent in the church and it ought not be. God's word is explicit. He has communicated his control, his sovereign control in passages, in accounts, in testimonies, in lives. You can't get away from it. The only way we would not know this is if we didn't spend time in his word. My heart as a minister is to encourage you and challenge you to make sure you spend time in this word and read it for yourself. Because sign number two of a compromised pulpit is when God's sovereignty is limited by man's psychology. In other words, when man thinks, God thinks like he thinks. My, inf my finite, puny mind thinks that God thinks like I think, all I got to do is read Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 and I see that my ways and my thoughts are so limited compared to God's infinite ways and God's infinite thoughts. There is no comparison. I cannot put them on the same plane. God does not think like we think. So to tackle the biggest question, which I don't mind non-believers asking, but the moment this question enters into the church, it needs to be addressed. And the question is about evil and suffering, about the coronavirus. Is God in it? Has God ordained it? I chose a biblical word. Ordained means appointed. Ordained means arranged. Ordained means allowed. Ordained means authorized. Ordained in the word means authored. And you don't gotta look far. This might sound very simple, but the very first place I go 
to answer any question about ordainment is the first chapter and the first verse. It says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. Which means every question, no matter what rabbit trail you follow, is going to eventually end with God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. From that point forward, the unfolding of humanity, the unfolding of history, and everything in between finds its ultimate ordination, appointment, in God's sovereignty, under God's control. Here's a proverb to confirm that. Proverbs 16.4, the Lord has made all for himself. Other translations say, all things that the Lord has made have a purpose. Right, so this is what liberal theologians try to do. They try to take God and get him off the hook with Proverbs like this. They go, that's not really what it means. So we explain away certain verses that say God has made all, there's the word again, for himself. And the reason why I love this proverb is because the Holy Spirit that inspired Solomon to write it, he put the refrain in place because the question is, oh, really, the Lord has made all for himself? He, he's made everything, evil, suffering, bad things, and we, the list goes on, you fill the blank. And Solomon goes, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. The Lord has made all for himself. Yes, even the wicked have been ordained to exist for the day of doom. Let's look at personal lives, how each one of our days are perfectly or ordained by a good, gracious God. We begin in John 9. The story begins as Jesus walks by a man that we discover is blind from birth. Forty years, he is physically blind. He lived with a physical handicap. He had no sight for 40 years. This was an affliction. And the disciples see that and they say to Jesus, a question, the question, why is there evil and suffering? Why is this man in this condition? And they say, who sinned? You need, they needed a reason. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus' answer is showing his sovereignty. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but so that the works of God could be revealed. And then Jesus heals this man, gives him back his sight. He goes from 40 years of walking in physical darkness to in a moment... Jesus shows off his glory and heals him physically. But that story's not done yet because there's a lot of questions that go, wait, you're meaning to tell me that he was physically born blind and you're telling me that was ordained by God. And I go, I don't know. I didn't say it. God said it. Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, when Moses is like, I'm not going to talk to Pharaoh. I have a stuttering problem. And God himself says to Moses, so the Lord said to Moses, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the man mute? The deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, saith the Lord? Yes, the Lord has ordained all of our lives to be what they are. And he gives us an opportunity with free will to choose him back. It was the Lord who allowed this man not just to have physical sight, because if you keep reading chapter 9 in John, at the end of the account, Jesus shows back up and says to him, do you believe in the Son of God? And the man who just gets to see for the first time says, who is he that I may believe? And Jesus says, I am he. You have seen him, and it's me who's talking to you. And it's right there where you make the connection. This man had to walk with physical blindness for 40 years, but my question is, was that 40 years of walking in that physical affliction worth an eternity of seeing Jesus? Because it was the salvation of his soul that mattered most. Psalm 139.16, your eyes have seen my substance being yet unformed, and in your book, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. When I read that verse, I realize every single second, minute, hour, day, week, month, and year of my life, all added up, have been ordained by God. My script has been written, and all I need to learn to do 
is look to the one who wrote my lines. And as any actor or actress understands, you learn your lines and you live out your day giving the one who is sovereign over your day complete glory. And this is a comfort when I recognize that every second of my life has been ordained, that God is sovereign and he's not trying to have us excuse him for calamity or crisis or catastrophic circumstances. God does not want to be off the hook. God is explicit in saying, oh, that, I'll own that. I'll own it all. In the beginning, God. I will own everything that has flowed forth from that point. It is my will. Where am I getting this from? Well, I don't know. Verses like Isaiah 45, 7. I am the Lord, there is no other. I form the light and I create darkness. I make peace and I create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. So while we try to spare God of the reputation of allowing evil and suffering, he in his word is very explicit in saying, no, I am in control of all of that. I am going to use all of that. I ordained all of that. Ecclesiastes 7 verses 13 and 14, consider the work of the Lord. For who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. In other words, so that we don't know what's to come, but he does. He's appointed prosperity. He's appointed adversity. And we look at one biblical account that liberal theologians who believe God's sovereignty is limited because he's given us free will. They completely skip over the book of Job. Chapter 1 in and of itself reveals there was great tragedy that entered this man of God's life, a man of integrity, a man who served God and shunned evil. This man had not put out any vibes, any energy that would have attracted evil. He wasn't speaking negative words. He wasn't using faith as a force. He was living in his spiritual lane, serving the one true God, and in the pages of God's word, we get to see heaven's window open up and the enemy himself coming before God and God himself telling the enemy, have you considered my servant Job? This is a question that God knew the answer to. You've considered my servant Job, is basically what he was saying. You've been snooping around his property. You've had your eyes on him. And Satan's like, you're absolutely correct. Does Job serve God but for your protection only? He's only serving you because you have a hedge of protection around him. And God's like, is that what you think? I will let you have access to his life. God's will for Job's life. And we know what happens next. And I'll put it on the horizontal. Groups of people called Sabians and Chaldeans, they literally raid and ransack Job's property. And they actually take all of his possessions. And in the process, it tells us they murder, murder his servants. And then one servant gets free and tells Job, you won't believe it. They came, they took all of our stuff. I was spared to tell you. And while he's telling this bad news, another servant comes because you won't believe this. There was fire from heaven, natural disaster. And it literally, it took the rest of our stuff, but I saved so I could come tell you. And then while he's telling that, another servant comes, you won't believe this. Uh, the Chaldeans came and they took all of our stuff. And then another servant comes and goes, you won't believe this. A tornado just took your children's house out and all 10 of them are dead. Not a fable, not a legend, not a make-believe story. This actually happened in history. And you want to know the response at the end of that? This is just chapter one. Job says, as he fell to the ground in worship, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And when I said the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible, it tells us, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. 
Now you might go, well, that's, what, that's just what Job said. That wasn't really God's will. That was the enemy. And I go, okay, let's go to chapter 2. Because the same thing happens. The enemy comes to God. God ordains him to be able to touch Job this time, but he can't take his life. And he afflicts Job from the bottom of his feet to the crown of his head with gross boils, or a.k.a. a disease. Now the wife has seen her husband and lost her children, and she's had enough of him praising God. And it says she comes to him and says, you need to give this up. You need to curse God and die, because that's what the enemy said Job would do. And who knew that Job wouldn't do that? The one that ordained it, the one that allowed it, the one that authored it, the one that authorized it, the one that sits sovereign king and Lord over it. And he says to his wife, Job 2, verse 10, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Now, I probably could find a case in scripture for Job sinning by treating his wife that way. I probably could find a verse, like I think he kind of borderline may have crossed the line by calling his wife like a foolish woman. I probably could find like a, a scripture that could back that up. But this is where the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. The very next part of that verse says, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. He just got done saying to his wife, you're speaking like a foolish woman. And then he attributed good to God, which is, of course, that's the faith that we want to have. God is only in what's good. But why is there not a footnote in the Bible that says, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips when he attributed good to God, but he sinned with his lips when he attributed Ra to God. Ra is the Hebrew word for evil. Shall we not accept good from God? Shall we not also accept evil from God? And the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of Job to write, in all this, Job did not sin with what he said. Now you probably wonder, why, am, why is he preaching on this? I don't know, because I can't scroll through any of my social medias without seeing believers tweeting or commenting their theology. Some of them are pastors, and one put a tweet out, a very popular pastor, and this was his tweet. The coronavirus isn't happening because God wanted to get our attention. God does not hurt millions so we can get a prayer life. Okay. Then what does 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 mean? Because God said to Solomon, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, that's called a drought, that causes people to suffer, or command the locusts to devour the land, that's called destruction, that causes people to suffer, or send pestilence among the people. Present day, that's called the coronavirus. That is causing people to suffer. Verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, then I will forgive their sin, then I will heal their land. God allows suffering to get our undivided attention. See, temporal suffering, while we're here on this earth, temporal suffering is like a grain, one grain of sand compared to all the grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. That's eternity. All the sands of every beach amounted to the grain of sand called my life. And we're saying God has the audacity to allow the grain of sand of my life, the brevity of my life, this temporary, blinking, fleeting existence. He's allowing me to suffer with a grain of sand. And I say yes, because there is an eternal amount of grain of sand called eternal beaches that we will spend time with him. And he is after one primary part of our lives. He's after our heart, the eternal state of our heart. So while many pulpits are trying to tell believers that's not God, that's not how God works, that is not how God accomplishes his plan, this suffering is only a result of a fallen and fractured world, I go, you're right about that. This suffering is a result of a fallen and fractured world. We can find biblical examples because of that. 
But what I'm saying is that's only part of the story. Everything that happens in this fallen world is to get us to exalt the risen Lord. Everything, our lives, and yes, even our deaths. You see, our deaths have been ordained by God too. The medium of death comes in all forms, be it old age, be it a heart attack, be it cancer, be it a car accident, be it a disease, be it coronavirus, be it murder, whatever it is that God has ordained the medium of death to touch our life, it is still to his glory. Okay. Remember, my job is to retalk God's talk. And I found in John 21, at the end of Jesus' earthly time, he has a conversation with Peter. He restores Peter back to himself. And in John 21, verses 18 and on, he says, Peter, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. There's ambiguity here. He says to Peter, when you were younger, you carried yourself, girded yourself, you took yourself where you wanted to go. But when you get older, somebody's going to gird you, somebody's going to carry you, and they're going to take you where you don't want to go. And I love the Bible because the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. And the next verse tells us what Jesus was talking about. Verse 19, this Jesus spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. This is God in the flesh telling Peter, I've ordained your death. And evil men, I'm going to allow to take you and beat you. And then they're going to drive nails through your wrists like my wrists. And they're going to hang you on a tree like they hung me. And Jesus tells Peter clearly, this is the way you're going to glorify God. Peter, of course, that's a hard word to hear. Turning around, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved following, that's John the Apostle. It tells us he leaned on Jesus' breast at the supper. He asked the question at the supper, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? This is the one that Peter's looking at. Verse 21 says, seeing him, he said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? You just told me about my future. You're God over my future. You've ordained my future and my death. What about him? And Jesus says to him, if I will, there's the word, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. John also makes a clarification. He says, then this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. Jesus said, if I will that you remain till I return what is that to you? I love this because Peter's question was, what about him? And Jesus says, I'm talking to you, your life, your death. It is my will, and you're going to glorify me in it. Can you imagine if the believers today had a theology of death that meant whatever happens at the end of my days, it is to the glory of God it is what Paul had in his heart that he wanted to share with Timothy. It was the reason he was able to pen such profound truths like, for to me, to live is Christ, yet to die is profitable. But no, we live attached to this world and we're so earthly minded. And God is trying to take our grips off of the things around us and try to get us to see that our spiritual life is all that matters. Our theology of death determines how we live this life. And if God isn't sovereign over my death personally, then I'm saying God's sovereignty is on the other side of my death. My death is outside of his sovereignty. And that's a terrifying thought. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, it has been appointed for man to die once. And then after that, the judgment. So what's the good news? The good news is God is in control. And the compromised pulpit is telling people that God's sovereignty is limited by man's psychology, man's thinking. 
Deuteronomy 32, 39, Moses' prayer. Now see that I, even I, am he, speaking on behalf of God. There is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there anyone who can deliver from my hand. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. This is Hannah praying to God. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave. He brings up. The Lord makes poor. The Lord makes rich. He brings low. He lifts up. These are prayers of men and women of God inspired by the Holy Spirit to remind us that God is sovereign. And Psalm 115 verse 3 says, our God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. All of these verses and more. Why? Because this is what Paul was asking Timothy to do. This is what verse 15 says. This is the charge. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. This is for the minister. This is the mission statement of every minister, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He's saying, Timothy, be diligent. Translation says, study to show thyself approved. That's only like half of this devotion. It's be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Mainly, be more concerned about God's approval than man's approval. If I came out here and was more concerned about your approval then God's approval, then this entire message would be thrown in the trash. Be diligent to present your life approved to God, a worker who does not need to be put to shame. In other words, your work as a minister, as a preacher, as a teacher is going to be inspected and God is going to put his light on it. And at the end of the days, if it was not in alignment with his word, God, please grant these ministers a repentance that they're polluting people's spiritual lives by going against your word. Rightly divide it means like a sword wielded accurately, carefully. Study to show yourself approved. Cut it straight like a plow. Dissect and arrange it like a priest does with his sacrifices. And like a chef, allot the portions that are appropriate For your people, the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said, Swords are meant to cut and hack and wound and kill with. The word of truth, it is for pricking men in the heart and killing their sins. The word of God is not committed to God's ministers to amuse men with its glitter, nor to charm them with the jewels in its hilt, but to conquer their souls for Jesus. The only reason I'm here is so that the word of God can conquer souls for Jesus so that the word of truth can cut away anything in my life that is keeping me from God so that the word can consume me so that I can become more like my savior. See, biblical preaching today is not popular. But the irony and sadly is that popular preaching today is often not biblical. See, the reason why the people are putting a lot of teachers on their shelves is because they're going to find a teacher that tells them what they want to hear to the tickling of the ear. And I'm saying God's word is to the scratching and convicting of the heart. Pulpits today need to be more concerned about conviction, convincing, than comfort. This word needs to be rightly divided. And when it's rightly divided, it is not about feeling good. It is about feeling God. Remember, the message of Christianity is Christ to the esteem of Christ, not to the esteem of man. It is Christ crucified, not behavior modified. It's the message of a God who is sovereign, over everything and the reason I can leave my house in the midst of a coronavirus crisis is because I know my God's got this he's in control if he's not then my advisement would be stay home if our God's not in control of everything then this is a terrifying world if it's my will that determines what's happening that's a devastating plot But the Bible tells me otherwise. And the reason I can have great hope is because my God is alive. And he's interactive and he's intimate and he's involved. And he's waiting for the Christians to begin rising and roaring. And he's waiting for us to stop looking like the world. 
When we stop looking like the world and we get serious with God and flames of righteousness again enter the pulpit and the people of God are hungry for truth and we pursue righteousness and we shun evil and we desire the one true God in Jesus Christ, oh, that is the moment that this place will see revival. See, revival will never begin outside of us. Revival first begins inside of us. And it's only the word of God that can revive a heart that has been sleeping. I want you to be able to have the vigilance with the same intensity that we are abiding by medical advisements, the same exact precautions that we have been taking to protect our physical health. I am saying that shouldn't be close in comparison to the precautions we take to protect our spiritual health. That we should practice spiritual distancing from anyone or anything that contradicts God's holy word. And because he controls it, I can have hope and joy in my day. My prayer is that as the word of God went out, that your heart began to receive it. That you would have a diligence in the word of God to study the word of life and then allow the life of the word to get inside of you. Would you pray with me?